Perfect. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, how to build and lead online communities course. Uh, this is the, the first one in a series of four, and it's a series that is trying to bring you knowledge on how to deal with networks and how to benefit from networks, how to activate uh, collective intelligence, and how to become more resilient through activating the power that's already inside your communities. Uh, the next one is going to be about communities and practices Friday, and this one here is about, of course, online communities. Um, well, I would like to uh, thank uh, to welcome not only our Q members who are here. Hi, hello, hey folks. You probably know me, <laughs> but also our non Q. If you're not familiar with Q, if you just bumped into this course because the theme was uh, interesting to you, we are a QI focused network based in the UK. And uh, soon I'm going to share a bunch of links so you can explore and find out more about what we do. Uh, you can uh, start typing questions as we go. At the very end, we're going to have a Q&A, so don't worry, we'll get to your questions eventually, um, but we'll do it at the end in a more organized fashion. And today's speaker is Richard Milton, author of Build Your Community, Turn Your Connections into a Powerful Online Community and the Indispensable Community, and also author of Buzzing Communities, How to Build Bigger, Better, and More Active Online Communities. He's also the founder of Feverbee, a company that supports organizations around the world to develop successful online communities. And they've worked with big names like the Maya Clinic, the United Nations, and even uh, Facebook. <laughs> so uh, uh, silent applause because it's Zoom, but a silent applause to Richard. And with you, Richard, the word, please. Awesome. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and hi everyone it's great to have a chance to connect with you to meet with you and i'm really excited to do the session today so let's go through the usual thing i'll share my screen and hopefully it all works and if it doesn't just let me know otherwise i'm just going to assume that everything is working okay awesome so thank you so what i want to talk to you about today in the next 90 minutes i think we have is how we can develop successful online communities for any groups that we're working with, whether that's patient groups, whether that's clin cl clinical groups, whether it's for doctors, or even just people of peers and colleagues in our lives. What are the core skills that we can use to build and lead successful online communities? At any point, if you have any questions or any comments, please put them in chat. I'm going to try and keep an eye on it. If it becomes an overwhelming experience, I'll do my best, but we might have to get to things at the end. But feel free to drop your comments in chat as we go. Uh, in the meantime, definitely please give an introduction. If you're just arriving, please feel free to introduce yourself, uh, what organization you're from and where you're from. So let me just check we're all okay. All right, I think we're good to go. So what I want to talk about today is how we develop communities the right way. What are the core skills that we need and how do we use those skills? Let me begin with a quick question for you all. Either in your professional life or your personal life, what communities do you participate in and why? Maybe take 30 seconds and put your answer in chat quick. What kind of communities do you participate in and why? Take maybe 20 seconds and quickly put your answer in chat. Let's see what we have. And if you're just arriving, yes, please um, feel free to be to be involved, be engaged. Um, but the question right now is what communities do you participate in and why? So I already have LinkedIn, subjects interest me, interesting communities around. Okay, there's a lot of comments here. Okay, this is awesome. X, really X still? Um, communities of practice, school moms. I love that one. I love these. Uh, religious communities, Twitch, Alf. These are great answers. Okay. Sports communities for fun. I love this. Communities of practice, football. All right. These are great answers. The Q community. Yes. I'm glad that someone said, said that as well. Communities that align with my values and interests. Okay. Do, do, do. Neighborhood groups to complain about the council. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> what we tend to find is that there's a whole range of different communities that we participate in for different parts of our lives. And usually there'll be someone that's responsible for growing, developing, and engaging those communities. What we find is when there is a community manager, the community tends to be a lot more successful than when there isn't. And fundamentally, 
the success or failure of a lot of online groups that are out there comes down to not so much the technology, although technology is important, but it really comes down to the skill of the person that is developing and growing that community. The more skillful they are, the more motivated they are, the more committed they are, the more connected they are, the more successful the group is going to be. And what we're going to go through is what some of these skills are and how we can use these skills as well. Our friends at the Community Roundtable often uh, use this framework here, where they break this down into a couple of really core skills, engagement skills, strategic skills, business skills, content skills, and technical skills. And we're going to cover a small slice of this, primarily the engagement and the content side today. The other skills are important if you're working in certain capacities, but I think the engagement and the content skills are the ones that really matter for us. And this does make a difference. Let me give you an example. We had a community a couple of years ago, or I guess six years ago now. It was growing slowly but surely. And then the community man man manager left and we didn't have the budget to, to replace her. And can you see what happened straight away? Almost the moment that the community man manager left, the level of engagement and participation in that community almost immediately, immediately plum plummeted. So the skill matters. And it works the other way around as well. Some of you may be familiar, familiar with, with Colleen Young from the Mayo Clin Clinic. And you'll notice that when she joined that, the community was pretty much dead. But she joined the community and she completed our course around the same time as well. And you notice the impact that she had. Immediately, when someone talented is managing a community, they can really bring that community to life and make it absolutely thrive. And so these skills really do matter. And where we're going to focus on today is a certain sliver of, of, of engagement skills and the content skills as well. Specifically, and don't worry, you don't have to write all of this down and we'll send out the slides afterwards as well. But specifically, I want to focus on this level here, which is where we've got the skills we are adept at engaging our members, where we know how to adapt our own interactions to improve the quality of results. And then we've become known and trusted as a respected, respected member of that community and can do great things like that. This is the area that I want to focus on. And the way we go about this is first is understanding why people engage in a community. Then let me ask you that as a question. With the communities that you participate in, what led you to join and what made you participate or what motivated you to participate? Because often those things are different. Take maybe 30 seconds to a minute and put your answer in chat. Think of one community that you joined. What motivated you to join? And then what motivated you to participate? Andrea says, peer support, shared interests, sense of belonging. Interesting, I like that. How about the rest of you? What motivated you to join a group that you're a part of? What motivated you to, to participate? Shared, shared best practices, like that career development, belief in purpose. These are good answers. Local running club. Ah, there's so much participation. Thank you. Fear of missing out. That's a great one. And that will come up in just a second. Uh, join because of the interest continues wanting. Yeah, okay. People shared interest, increased connection to grow. Uh, need for information, shared connections, interest. A friend suggested it. Yes, I like that. Getting and hearing information. Yes. Anyone else? I'll give it another 10 seconds, perhaps. Belonging, link to personal de development, to learn and network network i like that interesting things to do these are great answers yes okay so there's a model that we can use when we think about how we engage our groups and how we build a group i want you to think of this model here which is this is that there's reasons why people don't participate there's reasons why people then do join and participate and there's reasons that keep people engaged over the long term and when you think about how you're going to engage your audiences, these are the challenges that you have to overcome. Anytime that you might be struggling to engage in a group, this is the model I recommend that you think about. We've tested various models that are out there, and this is the only one that has consistently been predictive of the outcome. So the first step is this, which is you have to get over that 
that a motivated state. This is where people don't know you exist, or if we're going to be harsh, don't care that you exist. And there's certain steps that we can go through for this. The first challenge is we have to make sure that people know the community exists. There has to be a sense of awareness. I would say most of the time when a community is not as successful or an online group is not as successful as we want it to be, it's because most of the audience doesn't know the community even exists. And this happens again and again and again. And people think because they sent a message out or an email out that everyone, A, they opened it and they read it and they remembered what's in it. Those three things are very rare. And so the idea you can do one promotional burst and that's it, everyone knows that the group, the group exists, doesn't really work. What does work is having that sustained campaign over a long period of time, where you first figure out who's going to join, who you want to join, you figure out the way to reach them, you figure out the right messages to send, and we'll tackle that later in the workshop. But fundamentally, you get over the awareness phase. There have been numerous times where we've surveyed people that aren't participating in a community, and we asked them why. And they always say, nearly always say, they don't know the community exists. So that's the first challenge. The second part is they don't see the value of the community. They might know that your community exists, but they don't really see the value in joining that community. This is a messaging issue where you have to think of what is the right messaging and communication that has to be there for this to work. We'll touch more upon this later on as well. Third is where the value aligns with what they need and want, but they don't trust the community to deliver on that value. This occurs most often when you hear about a group and you and the group sound, sounds great and you join it and there's no activity. And there's no activity, so you're like, well, I'm not going to be the first person to participate here. That's not a good use of my time. So you don't trust the community to deliver on that value. Or maybe you participate once, you didn't have a good experience, so you don't participate again. The final one is the competition. This is when you do think you would get good value from participating, but you're already having that need met somewhere else. And so the first thing we have to do is tackle these chal challenges here. Figure out what is the communication message? What is the unique value? How are we going to make sure that when people visit that site or visit that destination or wherever it is that they have a good experience? And then we move into the next stage. This is where people are extrinsically participated. This is where people join and they make their first contribution to that group. And it varies, but the typical reasons here are these. First for immediate gratification. By far, the single most powerful way to get people to join and make their first contribution is to have that immediate gratification. That typically means the community is aligned to solve a problem that they know they have. It's very hard to solve pro problems that you don't know the audience has. Two, to, in to improve the skills and knowledge of the group, usually by access to unique expertise. And then the, the other side was that social reward. Maybe being part of that group increases their status. This works especially well when it's an exclusive group. And next is the group norm or fear of missing out. I think someone mentioned that already, where there's a fear of missing out by not being a part of that group. And finally, it's just to pursue a passion with like-minded individuals. This doesn't come up so much outside of ho 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 hobbyist groups. So I would focus on the immediate gratification. In the messaging, when you get people to join a group, I would very much focus on solving a problem that you know the audience has or improving the skills and knowledge of that group. These are the, the kind of things that people can take away and immediately apply. Let me go back. And next, intrinsic motivation. It's one thing to get people to join and participate once. It's far more difficult to keep them engaged over a long period of time. And you have to get them going from where they are engaging from that extrinsic motivation to when they're getting that satisfaction from having a genuine interest in that topic or enjoyment from helping others or just participating in that community. And we do that by increasing their sense of competence, autonomy, and relatedness, where we make them feel smarter about what's happening in that community, where they give them a greater sense of autonomy, and we gradually get them better connected to each other. And so here's a question for you when you think about this. When you think about the groups that you're engaged with or groups that you're, that you're running, what is the biggest challenge that you're seeing here? Take maybe a minute and put your answer in chat. Based upon this model, where do you need to focus your efforts? 
So take maybe a minute and put, put your answer in chat. I'm going to make an assumption here that everyone is here because there's some sort of group that they're engaged with or some sort of group that they're running or content they're creating, but there's some engagement work that you're doing. Let's see what we have here. Getting alignment towards a common goal. Yeah, that might be the value on, um, on the left-hand side, like making sure there's clear value in the community. Letting people know about it. Yes, that's a good one. Why is that a challenge? Let me ask you that, a question. That's Judy, Judy, right? Yeah. Showing them the value, the value of that community. Creating perceived value for members. Yeah, these are great answers. Really great answers. One of the challenges um, with value especially is there's value where people want to be better at what they do, but then there's that urgent va value of today. If I want to, say, grow my consultancy, that's a long-term goal. But today I might need to um, attract a client. I might need to send some sales emails. And it's these more immediate needs that tend to be quite good at engaging people in a professional group. Irina, immediate gratification once the community is joined is diff difficult. It's difficult, but there's actually some very specific steps you can go through to make sure that people get that. But it begins with understanding that first people need that immediate gratification. And so where I would focus on there is once people join, what is the next step? Like what is the very next step that you need, need them to do? And that should usually be uh, explaining a problem that they have that can be solved, or it should be making sure they get some sort of downloadable content or value or something that they can gain from that community right now. Uh, Sally, keeping people engaged when the audience is growing all the time, maintaining initial enthusiasm. Um, that's an interesting one, keeping people engaged. I think when engagement declines, it's usually because people no longer see the value in the group. Um, and so the challenge with that is often people come for one need and then they don't stick around. And so here we're to focus on that competence autonomy related to this side. I'd think about what's that journey you're going to take people on that gradually increases that. But that member journey matters. But the key thing is like, there has to be surprise value every time people visit the group. If they visit the group and it's a new discussion that's not re relevant to them, you're not going to get a good response. But if you can give them more surprise value, access to new experts, or to something they didn't expect, that's usually going to keep people around in the group. But the fundamental message from this is that people join to satisfy needs and they stay to satisfy desires. And a really huge part of your work and the work of anyone that's engaging any kind of group is to shift that, to shift someone that's engaging to satisfy needs, that's engaging to satisfy their desires, as in their desire for influence, their desire for satisfaction, a desire to help others. These are the kind of things that tend to have the biggest impact over the long term. And we do that by having really good, really sharp commu community skills. And we're gonna go through a bunch of these now. The first one, is how to initiate discussions which are engaging. And this sounds like the easiest thing in the world to do. And I've done workshops where people are like, I know how to start a discussion. I've been doing it my entire life. And then we look at some of their contributions in a community. And there's usually always, always the ways that these can be improved. So let me give you an example, a classic one, different sector entirely. Take maybe a minute and let me know what you think of this discussion here. This is an old one that I've been using for so long now because I think it encapsulates everything that you shouldn't do. This was a community posted in, I think, a Mercedes community over in like 2011. <laughs> okay, let's see what we have. Judy, loads of jargon and acronyms, yeah. So it says Cadillac had a strong February sales month up 60% due to the success of their CTS and DTS models, each more than doubled their sales in February, as well as the SRX. Jim O'Donnell, president and CEO of BMW North America, was recently quoted in Business Week saying the Cadillac, do people talk like this? Like, is this genuinely how people engage with each other? Is this how people actually talk? Like, it's too much information. It, if you were at some event and someone came up to you and said this, 
you would be very concerned about them, I think. And it sounds like an obvious thing, but like people post messages like this. They post messages like this all the time. They have this cor this corporate speak and they have acronyms. And by the way, who puts a quote into a discussion? Like it just doesn't make any sense. These kind of things shouldn't be happening. And also at the end, like I'm looking forward to hearing what you think. Do you think Melissa really is looking forward to hearing what you think? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, probably not. But these kind of things happen a lot. This is an extreme example of what not to do, but it does tend to happen a lot. Here's another example from a community um, of HR professionals. Take a minute to read, to read this and let me know what you think. So it reads, how would you feel if colleagues decided your, sa your salary, an Argentine and software company, 10 Pines, is doing just that? According to a recent BBC article, salaries are decided three times per year at so-called rates meetings. Everyone except new hires who are still on probation are included in the meetings. Employees can ask for a raise and the request is debated by everyone. On top of that, every year, 50% of 10 Pines profits are shared by staff. 10 Pines launched in 2010. It provides software services for clients, including Starbucks and Burger King. What do you think about this? Let's see the press release. Let's see. It starts with the question. Yeah. A little contentious. Definitely engaged. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a radical approach. That's not quite the point, but yeah, it is a radical approach. I think who's that? I think Fiona's probably got this. It begins well. It begins like with an interesting way of how human beings would talk to each other. But when you're talking to someone, you don't usually say, according to a recent BBC article, salaries are decided. Yeah, that isn't how people talk to each other. It begins okay, and then it loses its way. And it's really easy to fall into this trap. Um, and we see in so many communities out there where people will post a message, and it's okay. Like this is one I picked up from uh, your community. It's okay. Like it's okay. But I think there's huge scope for improvement in a lot of the discussions that we're posting out there. And what I want to do is take you through how we improve on some of the uh, questions that are out there. So here's some rules. Fundamentally, if you want an answer, ask a question. Time and time and time again. If you want an answer, ask a question. This is, a, I think, a community of food technology professionals. Um, and what you'll notice here is that it's only only the discussion that is asked as a question that gets any answers whatsoever. So the most basic rule, if you want an answer, ask a question. If you don't, you're probably not going to get that many responses. And remember this as well. If you treat your community like a note, no, a notice board, your members will as well. And what I mean by that is that they won't participate. They might read if you're lucky, but they're not going to participate. When we go back to uh, this again, we find out like most of these discussions, they're notices, they're not discussions. They're just someone that's posting information. We don't want to be doing that. So if you treat your community like a notice board, your members will as well. And we find out again and again that if you ask a question, you usually get far more responses than if you don't. So when you are going to start a discussion, ask a question. And we find that it's usually better to ask a question than make a, st a statement. We've done like a bunch of stud studies on this in different kinds of communities. I think this is from Reddit a while ago. But even just putting a question mark in the subject line tends to get more, more, more responses. And you can optimize things like the subject lengths and make sure that you're optimizing the, these things. But generally, don't make it too, too long or too short, it tends to be the rule. There are some exceptions to this. But generally, you don't want your discussion to be too long at all. And even at the extreme end, there isn't much data to go on. But you don't want it to be too, too long or too or too short. What's really interesting is looking at the number of replies. When we look at um, and gather data from so many communities that are out there and figure out what kinds of discussions get the most responses, actually, um, discussions that ask what to do tend to get a lot of responses. But what's really interesting is that the information that, pe that people want is how to do it. And I think the reason for that is when someone asks what, 
anyone can give an opinion. So it's really easy to respond to that. But what people typically need is how to do things. And so if you want a high quantity of replies, asking what to do tends to be good. If you want high quality of replies, asking how to do something tends to get a better response. Another key principle is to focus on what we call the emotional payoff, which means when you answer a question in a community, you usually do it because there's a payoff. And what I mean is that you don't get paid, obviously you don't get paid, but there's an emotional reward. You feel good about answering a question in a community. And so when you create discussions where people are going to have a high emotional payoff, the response tends to be a lot higher. If we go again, um, same commu commu community as before, we have here um, in Portugal, it's now illegal for bosses to call employees after hours. Failure to comply could result in government fines, yada, yada, yada. At the bottom, what do you think? Do, they, do you think there should be compliance measures regarding whether a job can contact someone after hours? The problem with what do you think discussions is that they don't tend to come off as authentic. We generally don't have discussions where we dump a bunch of information on someone and say, what do you think? Because it comes across in a way of, you're just trying to start a discussion for the sake of starting a discussion. No one's going to ask this and feel better about themselves because they don't know who they're helping. So let's change this. So this is what we had before. What if we do it like this? Which is, has anyone changed their policies due to a new law in Portugal banning managers from calling employees after hours? If so, what did you change? And can you share any part of it? My director has asked me to update our in-house guidelines for managers. I've been browsing the web for over an hour now, and there's absolutely nothing out there. P.S. I also noted this law requires employers to provide workers with appropriate tools for working from home. If anyone has any examples of that or what they did to accommodate that, it would really help. What do you notice about this? Quickly put your answer in chat. What do you notice about the second one compared to the first one? more conversational, more personal and friendly, asking for help. Which discussion would you feel better about answering? And why? Why the, sec why, why the second one? Feel useful, yes, yes, front loading. Yes, and so the point here, even if there is information you want to share, there's a way you can structure any discussion in any sector to make it more conversational and make sure that there's a clear emotional payoff. Like with that second one, if I read a discussion like that, I'm like, I can help this person and I'm going to feel good about helping that person. Whereas if I'm aimlessly sharing my, my opinion on a topic, that doesn't really appeal to me. So if you want more engagement and more responses, making sure you structure your discussions and your questions the right way tends to really, really help because people want to know that they're helping somebody else. And we can go through this. A, cup, a couple of things that really matter here is, again, the question is right at the top. This is generally a good idea because otherwise people tend to phase out of things quite quickly. So put the question right at the top. Next, you don't need to put quotes or a whole reading into a thing. You can just link to more information if you have to. And has anyone, we've actually tried this, tends to get more responses than anything else. Um, and when you're not asking for an opinion, but you're asking for specific information, people feel better about that. Asking for an opinion is like anyone can participate in that. But asking for specific information about what people have done tends to be something that people want to share. Asking a personal experience tends to be something that someone wants to share. People... While everyone can share an opinion, people love sharing their own experiences and expertise. And then we have the emotional payoff. We can see here how answering this question is going to make the recipient feel good about responding. And then we've added in some information as well. But fundamentally, this is how people speak. Like if someone came up to you at an event and asked this, this wouldn't be a surprising thing. Maybe the PS we wouldn't have at the end. But aside from that, everything else would just be how a normal person speaks. And very often with communities, we had to unlearn a lot of bad habits. And this raises the question of what do you do if you don't have that emotional payoff, if you don't need the information, but you're still trying to gain engagement? Well, I'm hoping you know other people that do need help and you can post questions on their behalf. There's ways you can always adapt this to suit your specific needs. 
but these are very specific things that you can use where you can find other questions and other things that um, have worked as well. Uh, we've got a question from, I think, Vardeep, if I'm saying that right. Uh, instead of any, anyone can use that. Um, hold on. Do, do, do. Instead of anyone, would you also... Oh, yeah, have, have you. Yeah, have have you is also good. Um, have you works have perfectly fine. For some reason, has anyone seems to get a better response because I think it's because has anyone it's kind of a presumption that you're tr that you've been struggling to find anybody that has so people feel special but um I think both work perfectly fine as well so understand the emotional payoff like people want to feel smart they want to feel helpful and they want to feel important and this is backed up by data as well there's been studies that have been done on this on specifically health forms as well and it indicates that when someone disclosed one's emotions during the support that they seek, they tend to get more responses and better responses as well. So if this thing you can begin doing and modeling this and encouraging top members of your community to do this, you tend to find that the response tends to be a lot better. Let's go through some other principles of great discussions here. So one is put the question in the subject line. This is 100% something that we have to be doing. We've seen already that if we don't put the questions in the subject line itself, the quality and the quantity of response tends to be a lot lower. Two is to put the call to action at the top of the discussion, the topic itself. Even if you're posting this on Twitter or social media or any kind of event group or anything, pulling the, the ask right at the beginning tends to be best, best practice here. Three is share what you're trying to achieve and why. What does it mean to you? Why are you doing this now? Why today? What is the thing that you're doing here? Why are you doing this right now today? Four, outline what you've tried already. Um, this tends to be a good practice so people don't recommend things that you've done before. But outlining what you've shared already is generally a good idea. Five is, disc is, dis is disclose or hint at the emotional reward to you. We'll talk more about that in a second. Then finally, solicit experience, expertise, resources, information, not opinions. It sounds like opinions are the way to go, but people wash out of that really easily because everyone can have an opinion on everything. The real value of a community isn't opinions. The real value of the communities that most of us are working in is when people can share their experiences and you can learn from the experiences of others. It's when people share their expertise and you can learn from the expertise of others. It's when people share their resources and you get new resources. Like communities are absolutely fantastic tools for spreading and sharing the best information because that's what a community does. You can get all of the expertise that each person has and everyone benefits as a result. Collecting a bunch of, of opinions is interesting, but collecting a bunch of expertise and experiences and resources, that is so much better. And that's going to build up as a place where people want to visit your community because there's so much great knowledge and resources, information out there. Someone asked right at the beginning, how do I keep people engaged? Well, the more high quality expertise and information there is in your community, the more engaged people are going to be. Let's try a random example because you see it's all over the place. This is, uh, let's see, this is a travel community, um, people that want to visit Th Thailand, very specific. What do you notice about this this discussion? Take maybe a minute. What do you notice about this discussion here? Is it generally following the principles we've covered or not? How would you rate it? Take maybe 45 seconds and put your answer in chat. One of the interesting things is a lot of people do this naturally, like in their personal lives, in their social groups, they do it in a natural way. And when they work on behalf of an organization, suddenly they adopt a corporate attitude and approach, which really doesn't work so well. Let's see what's here. Too busy for me? Interesting. Question at the top, emotional impact on display. Seems good. Emotional, but call to action unclear.
too many unspecific questions, too much information for getting to the point. Confusing, not clear what the ask is. I think where it does well is that it's got the basic information in there. You know, whether you know anything about this or not, that doesn't really matter. But it's got the basic information out there. Did anyone else get 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 this? I think it's referring to the image itself. Um, I think it could be better at putting the question at the top and understanding what people want. Any other ideas is really vague, but also if you've tried something and you're out of ideas, that could work. So I think this is okay. I think this is an okay response. It's friendly. It's natural. I could have used a hundred different examples. It's just one I picked, but I think you generally get the idea. Um, what about the the one on the left here? One of the reasons why we're spending so much time focusing on this is that it's a really critical skill to get right. Like when we when I talked about Colleen Young, um, Colleen is great because she's just fantastic at what she does, but she's great at doing the basics extremely well. Like when you saw that graph of no activity and then an explosion of activity, it isn't some magic trick that she's performing. It's doing these basics incredibly well. Okay, need to outline what they have done already. This is too, too broad. Where do you start? Yep, interesting. Question first. Yeah, I think generally here, there isn't enough information to work to work with, right? You know, maybe someone can work with this, but it's not really enough information to work with, I don't think. I think can any, anyone help is really vague. Also, how would we increase the emotional payoff as answering this? Like, there are ways we can do this. So this is an extreme example, but there are ways we can do this. We're just saying, hi, everyone. I'm looking for a few printer experts out there. I've tried installing something of driver, but it keeps coming up with whatever the error is. I've tried X, Y, and Z, but still nothing. I would call customer support, and it's not open until tomorrow. And I need to print out tonight and take it to the passport office tomorrow to get my new passport for my honeymoon to Barbados. Honestly, I'm laying it on a little bit thick here, but you get the idea. Can anyone help? I'm getting worried I can't fix this. Again, adding that emotional payoff really increases someone's likelihood of, being, of participating. And also people go to extreme lengths to help if it makes them feel really good about themselves. They definitely want to help you, but the payoff for them is that it really helps them feel a lot better about themselves. Or if you do share your experience work, working from home, again, this is kind of bland. There isn't really much here to work with. But if we say something like, I'm hoping someone can help me. I've been working from home for over a year now, but it's starting to get lonely and it's been hard to stay positive. Is anyone else feeling this? What's helped you? Any help be appreciated? This is one of those rare exceptions where I might put the question at the end because I feel the backstory kind of helps. But you get the idea. There's more of an emotional payoff here. You're not just starting a discussion for the sake of starting a discussion. There's a very clear outcome that you want here and you're adding that emotional payoff. And you can see the specific words, you know, help me, lonely, staying positive, is in us feeling this, what has helped you. Again, it's a listing personal experiences of things that have helped. And so where possible, we want to model this behavior ourselves. We want to use this behavior. We want to work with top members. And if we have that possibility to really try and teach members to ask great, ask great questions. If we can't do this within whatever platform we're using itself, we can do it in the welcome emails that we send out. We can use it in other content we send out. Stack Overflow used to be a fantastic example of this where they outlined the basic things to do. You'll notice here, they are very specific say, avoid asking opinion-based questions. And I think that's generally a good rule for a lot of things, especially in online community. Opinions are always interesting, but we really want to have something more specific here. So spend five minutes on an activity. For whatever group or, um, yeah, for whatever, every, every group you're engaging with or managing or however or whatever bring, brings you here today, I want you to create a question for your members using the principles that, that we've covered. Take maybe five minutes on this and put your answer in chat. So using the principles that we've covered here, I want you to create a question for your members using these principles. Take up to five, five minutes and put your answer in chat. And if you have any questions, you can put um, those in chat as well.
I'm going to do my best to respond and acknowledge as many comments in chat as possible. It's not always possible because the level of engagement is fantastically high. Um, but I'm going to do my absolute best. So apologies if I don't acknowledge you. Take another, let's say, four, four minutes and come up with a question for your members using the principles that we've covered. What you find is when you begin doing this um, in various other parts of your life, you get higher quality responses. People generally, I think, want to help, but they like knowing the impact of that help. Okay, three and a half minutes. Your question doesn't have to be long. Like it can be re relatively short. Three minutes left. Robert, thank you for go for going for go going first. I appreciate it. Okay, let's see what we have with Robert. What do you think is a waste of time in clinic? I've been trying to think of ways to save time and reduce our workload in clinic as part of my PhD. Then we managed to cut anything out of their clinic workload in the past few few months. Um, and how and have you managed to use the time save for other more useful activities? I think that's generally pretty good. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. Do, do, do. The only thing I might tweak is why you're trying trying to think to think of ways to save to save to save time. I think there might be an opportunity to add a bit more of an emotional payoff. And by the way, I'm well aware like different cultures, different people with different approaches to that, and not everyone wants to be emotionally vulnerable online, and that's totally fine. You know, do what works for you. Um, but these are tools that you can use in your situation. But Robert, I think that was good. Um, yeah, pretty clear, pretty direct. It's how human beings talk to 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 each other. I think that's good. Uh, who's next? Fiona, what are your favorite check-in exercises? I'm looking for some rare ones as I've got into a rut of using the same ones I've used for ages. Yeah, I think that's okay. Uh, do do do. Yeah, I think that's good. I might. Hmm. There might, there might, might be something more you, you can do with Rut, but like um, to add the emotional payoff. I think that's that's good. Yeah. Catherine, okay. Welcome to Quality Link MS Teams channel. The best communities are ones where we all engage with and support each other. So let's kick this off. Please introduce yourself, your name, areas of work, favorite thing to do, and any quality experience. Uh, Catherine, do, do, do. Um, to be direct, I'm not a huge fan of this. I think. I understand what you're trying to do, but generally people don't need to be welcomed um, into a channel. Like if people have done it, they know they're in there and then it can come off a bit hollow. I think what would be really interesting looking at this is um, is let's kick things off. Uh, yeah, um, please introduce yourself, your name, area of work. I think it'd be interesting to explain why. Like why, what is the benefit of someone from introducing themselves, their name, area of work, fa 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 favorite thing to do? You might want to highlight the importance of getting to know to know each other, something like that. Something that adds more of like a reason to do it other than just doing it. Uh, let me do a couple more of these. Again, I'm not going to get through everyone, but if you want to give feedback on, on each other in chat, feel free to do that as well. Uh, Emma, how can we help you more easily make improvements happen in your area? We are working to empower all staff to, to be able to make the improvements they want to see happen in their area. We want the people... We want that. Uh, we know that people find it easier to work through things following a process, and there's a lot of tools that can help. However, we don't want to overwhelm everyone. What could help you and your colleagues in your area? So this is interesting. Um, this is easy. What I would suggest, if you're able and allowed to, is speak in the first person where possible. The moment you go to we, it's hard for people to feel like they're helping an individual. Um, so if you can speak in the first person, I would always recommend that because the moment you go to we, it becomes more of an impersonal thing. Um, 
Do, 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 do. Yeah, I think it's it's okay. The structure of the question is good. Uh, I think focus on I if 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 you can. I know not every organization can, but if you can, um, yeah. Do, 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 do. Let's do maybe one or two more. Judy, thank you. Has anyone found a good way to practice clean language in written form? A friend wants to practice before a class next week, but almost all their interactions with colleagues are written. They keep hesitating before adding a question in their emails. I'd love to share some successful, some successful examples to encourage them. Judy, that's perfect. I absolutely love that. That is exactly uh, what to do. I think you referred to friend. I think, um, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that's really, really great. Thanks. Really, really great. Uh, let's do a couple more. Joe. Hey, I've been asked to deliver training for our new starters in QI, in Q, or Q, on, on QI. They're a lovely young group who really like video content, discussion starters. Any ideas of resources or how you've managed to deliver a similar session to really get them engaged? Thanks. Yeah, that's great. I think asking people specifically for their experiences or things they've done is much more useful than asking for opinions. Yeah, this is really good. Uh, da -da. I might be tempted to put the question at the top, but I think that's really, really great. Okay, we've got more messages I think I can, can get through. Yeah, feel free to respond and give feed, give feedback on each other's. Uh, let me pick one more. Um, let's say Sue. Uh, do you have any experience of clinical supervision in healthcare? I've been asked to review our organization's clinical supervision po policy and would like hearing of your experiences of how this is conducted in the real world. Yeah, I think that's good. Do you have any experiences? Uh, I think one thing I might change, do you have any experiences? I mean, people could just say yes. So you might want to be more specific about what you want, like what is the kind of experience that would be most useful to you. But these generally, yeah, these are all good. Uh, I'm going to continue, but if you have any examples you want to run past me after this, then feel free to drop me a line. I'd be happy to help. But I just want to make sure we get through the rest of the workshop. But these are really, really good. Thank you so much for sharing. So let's go to part two. How do we sustain a discussion once it is live? I did spend some time going through your community, and I know a lot of it takes place through through events, which I didn't have much access to. But looking at some of the discussions that were there, I think there's a lot we can do to improve. A couple of really important things. Obviously, make sure every question gets a response. Like we've done a lot of studies of this. We've looked at the data. And generally, if people don't get a good, quick response to their first question, they never participate again. And so it's really important that if you are managing a group and people make a or ask a question or make any contribution, they get a response. Think about how you would feel if you post a question and no one replied to you. Like, how sad would you feel about that? You would never participate again. So just make sure that people get, get a response. Also, the speed of response is quite important. I know we all have busy lives, but bear in mind that the likelihood of someone making a second contribution they don't get a good quick response to their first drops precipitously. Um, oops, let me go that. So yeah, just make sure that people get a response. I mean, these are the basics. If we're running a group and someone makes a, a contribution. Let's just consider it good form to make sure that people do receive their response. The quality of response also matters. So I've, I remember when I first taught a version of this and I said, yeah, just make sure that every discussion gets a response. And someone began replying to every question with good question, good question, good, good question. That's not the point of this. The point of this is that the quality of response is actually good. Let's review some replies. And let's go to my favorite person in the world once again, Colleen, Colleen Young. So this is, you don't need to know what the question was, but this is a very typical response by Colleen to a question in her community. Take maybe two, two, two minutes. What do you notice about this? What occurs to you about this response? What do you like about it? Is there anything that you don't like about it? Samantha says too, uh, too, too many ads. That's interesting. No real names. I would have... I have it this that in a health commu community, often you don't know the real names of the people. Um, that's a that's by design, so um, I wouldn't judge that. Um, 
you survive seems personal, useful, uh, friendly and adding value, connecting people, helpful connections. Be like, be specific. What are the very specific things that you notice that she's doing here? So we've all noticed that she's at mentioning other people to to respond. That's good. What else has has she, has she done? Give specific help. Yep. Wants an update. Yes. Who said that? Joe. Yes. That's actually very, very clever because it encourages that person to come back and respond again. And that gets them into the habit of visiting and engaging that community again and again and again. Welcome the member. Yes. Another really useful thing. And let's think about those, um, those, those app mentions again for a second. If you were at mentioned into a discussion like this, how would you feel? How would you feel if you were tagged in to participate in a discussion like this? Special, known, exactly. You would feel you have expertise, that you've demonstrated something that you can participate and engage in. You feel seen, wouldn't get. Yeah. yeah, pretty much everyone's saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, it does depend on who tags you and why, but generally, yeah, this is all great. Um, exactly what we want. So specifically, this is what Colleen is doing. First, she's at mentioned the individual. So they know they're getting a personal response and many platforms mean that sure that that person will then be tagged and be notified of that response. That's smart. Second, she's added the, wel the, wel the welcome. The interesting thing is, how does she know if it's a member's first contribution? Can any can any, any any of you guess? How does she know it's that member's first contribution? There is a clue in here. She has paid attention and looked. Where specifically has she looked? Yes, there it is. I think Neil's Neil's the the the, 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 the uh, winner on that. Yeah, she's noticed that the number of posts is actually listed on the left-hand side. So when Household has exactly one post, she noticed it's their first contribution. Second, she's, she's specifically referenced the question itself. You don't know the, the question, but it's not like a generic response. She's not just replying with good question. Next, she's tagged in the other people to respond. She's also shared a link to you to useful information so that person isn't wait isn't wait isn't waiting around. They can get some information. And then she's asked for a second post as well. What's really interesting about this is that there's nothing complex about this. You know, it's nothing difficult. It doesn't require any great leap of skill or imagination. But very few people can do this 7,000 times. But what's remarkable is that you've seen the results, that graph I showed right at the, the beginning with that community exploding. This is how she did it. There's no magic tricks here. It's just doing community skills incredibly well. And so specifically, this is what makes the response great, is where it's within 20, 24 hours. It's as personalized as it can possibly be. It's made that personal connection, if possible. It's tagged in other people. It shares useful information and solicits a follow-up as well. And you can see it's in discussion after discussion after discussion. So let's look, look at this one again. What do you notice about this? You notice I took this screenshot years after the first one. Like she's genuinely been doing this for years. What do you notice about, about this? Take maybe a minute to put your answer in chat. What you should notice is that we're covering a lot of the same things again. But doing the basics well and consistently is generally what is going to make a lot of communities more successful than what they are today. Even if you're um, hosting an event and you're doing it that way, this is a great way to get a lot more engagement. So what you should hopefully be noticing here, oh, oh we've got some responses I want to respond to. Uh, connecting with the person, yeah really engaging response the initial post doesn't have a clear call to action or question yeah you often get um honestly with audiences that are older in a community the questions tend to be the varying 
in um, the quality and standards that we te we're, we're teaching here. But you know, uh, we work with that. Um, yeah. So you can see here all the same principles are in place again. The app mention, the welcome, because once again, she's noticed that that person's new to the community. Um, that information tag tag tagging in more pe more pe more people. And then she's asked a follow-up question at the end again to get someone to participate and to engage in that discussion again. This is what high quality responses look like. But what tends to happen is we often get responses in communities that are like this. Let's look at that response on the left. What do you think of that response? Maybe a minute to put your answer in chat. What do you think of that response? Yes, Vardeep. She is essentially using really good coaching skills. Um, yeah. Vincent says there's no invitation to come back to the to the discussion. Yeah, that's correct. Um, by the way, if I ever use an example that's you, it's not like a personal thing. I just needed like a variety of examples I could use. What else do we notice about this this response? What's good? What's bad about it? what's good and what could be improved about it. It's useful that they've shared more more links. Yeah, the link is 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 useful. I mean ideally it helps if there's like a platform um that will automatically create the link, but yeah, the link's useful. Uh, mentioning the person by by name is good. Um it's it's okay. The response is okay. But I think we could do a lot better, if possible, by bringing in other people into that discussion, asking a follow-up question at, at, at the end. Um, small things that can have a big impact tend to be quite useful. And just remember as well, like as it says here, every interaction is an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to increase that level of um understanding it's an opportunity to make that person feel better about themselves it's an, on, in a, an opportunity to get that person more engaged in a community it's not just a list of questions you have to respond to it's a list of questions you get to respond to and that's a really good and really exciting thing to do and you have to treat it that way i want to move move on quickly here to events and activities how many of you use events as part of your community engagement activities How many of you rely on events for your community engagement activities? And Fiona, Fiona says yes. Yes, lots of events about to. Here's a question for you then. What is the goal of your event? What is the goal of your event? And this could be an online event or an offline event, but what's the goal of your event? Help others get to know, sharing best practices, sharing knowledge and skills, sharing knowledge and skills, developing connections. There's an interesting mix. I like it. To get like-minded people in, in order to engage together. Okay. So when we think of um, taking an event-led approach, we think of it from the perspective of a strategic goal, the value to the organization or you, the key features and the event type. And sometimes people just host events to get a bigger audience engaging and participating. And um, that could be new new customers, new members, any audience that works for you. And there's certain features you see for that. This is usually where you find a big speaker with a big following and they can invite invite their people to, to reach you. Whether it's online or offline, that could be a big exhibition or it can be a web webinar as well. Um, all of this applies to, our, to, on, to online events as well. Second, there are events where we tend to increase engagement. Sometimes that's retention of the audience that you have, sometimes customers, but it varies a lot. And this is usually where we have things like um, that are designed to have as much engagement as possible. 
So speakers leading online discussions, breakaway groups, creating opportunities to rate the talks, follow-up discussions, live streaming events. These kind of things tend to work well. Then we have events that are designed to spread to, to, to spread knowledge. And if you're doing these kind of events, and it seems like many, many of you are, this is where we want to be very careful about how we get the recording and how we share that recording. One of the things I wouldn't recommend is to record an hour long talk with a speaker and then publish that talk in its entirety because people generally don't want to listen to talks that last an hour. What you might, might want to do instead is then edit that talk in summary and find the key, the key points, post it on different platforms that are out there and spread that knowledge as far as possible. If it's to foster a sense of commu community, this is where we want to have rituals and traditions. This is where we want to assign members to very specific roles and have that shared history. This usually we want to have facilitated small group um, sessions to trust. Um, maybe you have some symbols or dress codes, which doesn't really work as well on, on um, online events. And finally, we have groups where just want people to feel to feel to feel better. This is the changes the nature of the event we have. We might have a motivational speaker to give to to give to give a talk. We might plan out what is the major announcement and the high point and the low point. Whether you're doing this online or offline, a lot of the same principles still apply. And so what I would suggest for whatever goal of the event you have is to make sure you're aligning it with what we want people to be doing. What is going to make that really, um, what are we going to put in place to really make us achieve our goals? That's where we can take an event that's at a list level and really take it to a top tier level. But think, but work backwards from the goal that you want to, to achieve. So I'm going to skim through this quite quickly because we covered this already. If it's new, new audiences, generally focusing on, pe on people that are new to the topic tends to be the biggest win. Um, I think it often gets ignored that after a community has been around for a while, your best source of new people to that group are people that are new to the topic. People that are first being uh, first working in that field or first being diagnosed with that condition or first, you know, done whatever. But it'll be people that are new to the topic. And I would recommend your community, your group being a definitive place for people that are new to the topic. And if you can do events that align with that, that can be a huge, huge win. Also, if you want to grow any group or activity quite quickly, is bring a speaker with a following and then ask them to encourage their, fo their, their following to join the group as well. That's worked very well for a lot of our clients in the past. Two, if you want to increase engagement, they'd have as many engaging activities in there as possible. Rating talks, voting on speakers, breakaway groups, um, having subgroups, initiating those, those discussions that we talked about. These things work incredibly well. If it's sharing knowledge, then make sure that you're not just hosting the event, but then you're making it um, digestible. So you might have a summary of each talk in very, di very digestible chunks. You might be inviting members who share the best expertise in the community each month to give talks. You might be asking members to share resources and templates that can be shared with your audience. So it's very specific, specific things you can put in place that are going to encourage that sharing of knowledge. Instead of just having a speaker talk for an hour, you can put in place the very specific things. If you're hosting a workshop, and forgive how meta this is about to be, um, it's really important that you put in place where systems where people can acquire the skills. And that typically means that people need to learn what to do, they need to practice it and get feedback on it. And workshops are very powerful, online or offline, they can be very powerful ways because they're more interactive, they're more engaging. And you can see even for this workshop that we did today, we put together what the learning outcomes were, what the activities are going to be, and then what the time frame of that looks like. And I would very recommend following this kind of outline where you focus on what the outcome is going to be, what the activities are, then what specific time you're going to dedicate to it. And there's so many different activities that you can do. You can have interactive activities where people work together in a small group to identify what their needs are and what they want. You can set up tasks on Mural or other tools that are out there today where you can set a very, spe very specific challenge and then people could highlight where they are on that challenge. We've done this before where we have people go through that process to optimize what they want and then we cat, cat, categorize them. And then we can run games and activities where people say have three tokens and they can say which of these matter the most to them. And again, work backwards from the skill that you want people to acquire. 
once you're very clear about the skill that you want someone to acquire, then you can think of ways that people can do that. And there's so many templates that you can use. On Mural and elsewhere, even the most basic workshop where you're just having people share what, what they want, there's so many tools that you can use where people can do that. Mural and Figma, not Figma, I've forgotten the other one. Um, Mirror, I think. Mural and Mirror are great tools for that. And you can run workshops that we've done many times and it's just kind of works. You're going to have people um, in a situation where people are going to highlight what used to work, what works today, and it can make it very interactive very easily. If you want people to pri to pri to prioritize what matters to them, as in work working and collaborating together on the way forward, then you can have a, a chart like this where people can highlight what's important, what's feasible to them. There's so many ways of doing it. But what I would focus on is what is the activity that's going to resonate most with the resources and capabilities and structure that you have. Sometimes it's practice and role and a role play sit, sit, situation. This works incredibly well when you're teaching people something that they're going to say or something that they're going to do in a situation, and then you can practice that situation. Having tests or questions that you ask so then people can work together to find the answer, that can work really well as well. Having scenarios that people can tackle where there are case, case studies that they can work through and then they can present their options, that works really well. This probably works better um, in person than it does online. Pairs and group discussions work well. As long as you don't say something like, discuss between yourselves this topic. That's too vague. Like You have to be very specific about what you want people to discuss. But if it's card games, for example, then you can have like different cards that people can play. And this tends to work well as well. It works well if you have different ways that people can approach a situation and they can decide which card makes sense to them. So there's a variety of options that you can choose. But what I want to do today, and again, this is so meta at the moment, but think about one learning outcome you would want for your audience today, and then one activity that would make sense for that audience. We're going to spend maybe five minutes on this. So pick one learning outcome for today, and then one activity that you'd want. Yeah, as some of you know, like, yeah, there's some great tools out there. Jam, Jamboard, I didn't know that was closing. That's disappointing. Um, one of the things if you use Zoom a lot is to read the release notes of each update that come out because there's always new features that are being added. Um, the downside of using Mural or Mirror, especially for an online event, is just taking people from one platform to another. And there's pros and cons of everything. With uh, break, breakaway groups, that's an option, but... Not everyone is familiar with how that works, and that can be confu confusing as well. But just understand where your audience is at today and, um, yeah, see what makes sense for you. Anyway, the activity. What is one learning outcome or one skill you'd want your audience to require, to acquire? And what is uh, an activity that you could use to, to teach that skill? And I'll quickly go backwards so you can see the activities or the options as well. One thing I would say as well about workshops is don't ask people to do things that take them a long time to do. You know, if you're asking people to write a proposal or something that takes a long time, it just doesn't work well. Like, yeah, it just doesn't work well. So either have examples that you can use where people can um, do it them, them themselves or like rate the, the answer or the quality of, of different things or uh, try a different activity. Anyway, the task is find one skill you want your audience to learn and then what would be a good workshop activity you can do either online or offline. Another tip I'd say is try to reduce um, try to reduce the complexity um, and the preparation work that's required. The more prep that people have to do before a workshop, I found the less people attend the workshop because they haven't done the prep the prep in time, which can be a good thing to be honest, but um, it means less people will be participating. Judy, thank you. Learning outcome. Know what makes a clean language question clean. Activity, card sort on whiteboard in small groups up to three people, categorize a bunch of example questions. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. What's clean, what's not clean, yeah. 
so online whiteboards are difficult because people can often see each, each other's works, but there's different tools that are available for that. Do we have uh, Deanna, I think. Uh, do, we do a lot of hands-on activities, spaghetti and marshmallow challenge, and then exploring leadership communication and prototyping. Do you do the marshmallow challenge with adults? I'm fascinated to see that. <laughs> um that's amazing okay i would love to watch that uh lots of activities out there on the web yeah there's lots of activities and templates and tools and resources out there give it maybe another 30 seconds What do we have? Uh, one of the advantages of Jamboard is being able to focus on your own page, but be able to look at the others. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know quite, quite how, to, how to pronounce this. Inari? Inari? Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, learning outcome. Identify satisfactory evidence for signing enough competencies. Uh, discuss summaries, topics covered in pairs, and discuss and hopefully agree about findings in plenary. Yeah, it's okay. I think discuss, I'm always a bit nervous about discuss because i feel it's very vague so you might want to be more specific about what you want the outcome of that discussion to be uh discuss the topics in pairs and agree about finding yeah i might want to be a little bit more specific but that's okay um oh jan uh learning outcome improve medicine data literacy activity scenario challenge with group discussion yeah scenarios work really well like asking people how they would tackle a scenario for that, you usually need people to present the answer to, to the group as well. And that tends to work well in groups of four as well. I'm going to move on just so we can cover everything in the session. So some advanced engage engagement skills I want to cover before we wrap things up. And some of the things that I think are very important to know is one is what's called asset-based community development. This is the idea that every single member can make a unique, useful contribution to the group even or maybe especially if they don't think they have anything to offer. What ABCD, ABCD does, it takes the idea of a group as a problem to be solved and looks to see what assets, skills and resources that people have and then see how they can contribute them to the group. It works really well um, even if it's a relatively small, con small, co small contribution. Your goal is to make sure that every single person feels like they can make a unique useful contribution to the group and there's so many options there's so many things that people can contribute to any group online or offline the I, the way that we approach this is to figure out what is the best contribution that people can make with the resources skills or knowledge that they have and then we communicate that in all of the messaging that we send out so here's two two messages which do you think was most effective which do you think was most effective in getting people to re-engage in the community? I think maybe 20 seconds and put your answer in chat. A lot of people say two. Why two? Yeah, once again, it's asking for help. It makes people feel like they can do something specific. There's a unique, useful contribution. This is actually something we did with a client a while ago. We had a, um, a intense debate, we'll say, about which message to send out to people that had a bit engaging. And so we did a test, and this is what we found. M message one had an open rate of 11%, reactivation rate that was less than 1%. Message two, our one, had an open rate of 24% and reactivation rate that was so much higher. So just understanding the basic psychology of how to engage people in a community will have great results. Generally, when there's a sense of curiosity, people are going to open emails well. When they feel there's something specific they can do, they're going to open the message. And when there's that commitment principle in place where people make a small contribution before making a bigger one, that tends to be incredibly successful as well and link it to a higher purpose. You can actually design a system, if you like, where you can have personalized responses to every single person, where if you've got the resources or if you're doing this in a full a full full time capacity, you can check after X days of their first post, how did they participate? What's the response and what kind of interaction should we do afterwards? 
this is only if this is a full a full time role. It's overkill for everyone else, I think. But I can share this with you afterwards if you like. And again, really with the ABCD approach, it's about making sure everyone feels like they have a unique role, a unique asset, something special that they can contribute to the group. So when you send out a message like saying, hi, I really love your post about topic last week. Did you find the answer? I think our members might really benefit from learning more from your experiences if you might be interested. I'm thinking it might be great for you to run a group, or write a blog or host an event or whatever. Let me know if you're interested. What you're doing here is you're taking that commitment principle and you're finding ways that people can engage and participate in the community. You're making sure that they feel like they have a unique role, a unique benefit, a unique asset that they can contribute to the group. So the more you can make people feel like they do have that unique, useful contribution, the more they participate. The more that they feel like experts, the more they participate. And you can even go out to members in situations like this where this is a message I got year, year, years ago from Ed. And let, actually, let me ask you, what do you think ab about this? This is a message I received year, year, years ago. And I took a, screen, a screenshot of it because it struck me as a very interesting way of getting engagement in a, a community. Yes, a ABCD stands for Asset-Based Community Development development Judy Ju, Ju says says it's fake that's interesting you know what it is actually an automated message which is interesting but it comes across as a very personal message what's clever about it is that it makes me feel like an expert I feel like he's reaching out to me specifically so things like this can help engage commun engage community as well but I think ABCD is one of those core um, sets of knowledge and principles that we should have and we should apply where we make people feel like they can make unique, useful contributions to the group. A couple more things I want to cover before we wrap things up. One is when we communicate, do it by simplifying our messages. Very often that means chiseling down to the core message that we want to send. When we look at many communities, including yours, what we want is a core message. What is the motivational thing that's going to get people to engage and participate? Welcome back. I hate to say it is not a core message. It's not a motivational thing that gets me to engage and participate. So what is? If we think about what's on the site at the moment, what would be a core message that gets people to engage and participate? How can we do that in a very persuasive way? Again, what's a memorable message that's going to stand out here? Let me go through a few examples of what we mean. So one is that we want to focus on the core thing and we want to avoid anything that sounds like a cliche here. And this often means that we have to avoid what's known as the argument dilution effect. The argument di dilution effect works like this. There's one message on the left and there's one message on the right. Which do you think is most effective? Take maybe 30 seconds if you can put your answer in chat. Most people say message one. Some people say message two. So it's actually m m message one, even though that doesn't make sense because message two has more benefits than message one. But what happens here is when you combine strong messages with weak ones, the weak ones dilute the strong me messages. So we've got to be very careful when we're communicating anything that we're not diluting strong messages with weak ones. Very often when people launch a community or they promote a community, they combine very strong messages with very weak ones as well. And often you've just got to find what the most important message is and communicate that. We're running a little bit behind, so I'm probably going to send the content side out um, uh, via slides as well. Or I can record a video and do a, fo a follow-up as well. What I want to do is make sure we have a little bit of time for people to ask ask questions. So what I would suggest, if the Q team wants to jump in, if Joe, if Joe, if you want to jump to jump in and take questions now, and we've got like maybe ten more slides that I can cover after this as well, and I can do a recording of that. I just make sure that everyone has uh, some time to ask questions before we wrap things things up. 
John, if you want to jump in here, then feel free. Oh dear. Um, sure, let me jump in as quickly as I can and focus the reality is that uh, at 5-2, we're going to start wrap up. So we don't have time for a lot of questions. Uh, the, how about that? Uh, if anybody who, uh, in the Q team who is also in the call uh, could um, paste uh, a SIG or a group or somewhere where people can, after the call, paste a couple of questions and we deal with them after, after the questions, that would be fantastic. But we do have time for at least one question. And I've got a question that I saved from uh, Wolfgang minutes and minutes ago that I thought was interesting. Uh, Wolfgang, are you still on the call? Would you like to ask your question or would you like me to ask it out loud for you? If so, you can just uh, ask Absolutely. on the chat. I can ask that, uh, unless you want to read it out. <laughs> no, Richard, thank you very much for, for your insight. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the uh, current hype around all these AI tools, um, which um, have a high proficiency in manipulating language. And uh, lots of stuff that you recommended is about uh, using the right language. So um, and my question was, if there are tools available not to the tech billionaires uh, which run their algorithms on their large youth communities, but um, where there is technology that may observe, probably analyze, and probably even trigger activities within a community of, of people, and not necessarily or well, not only in respect of um, engagement, of, at any price, but in a certain direction. Yeah? So this would be something I would find pretty valuable if it existed, which I don't know if it does. Uh, AI is a really interesting thing at the moment. Like it's still, it's still so new, and there's so much uncertainty and uh, about it. I think what you're describing will be very possible in the very near future. Um, I don't know any platform that has that enabled right now i think with ai at the moment our approach is we're going to wait a couple more months and see what emerges because it's just a field that's evolving so quick so soon i think with ai it's one of those things where there's going to be an abundance and there's going to be new new scarcity like you know things like um what i'm describing might be uh something that ai tool can 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 prompt but if people begin to suspect it's not a real person, I think that's going to lead to another issue as well. So the honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like mm -hmm. AI is not my core field of expertise, but what you're describing sounds feasible. I just don't know if it's good or bad. I think it's going to be very good for the top platforms that are out there. I think for smaller groups, I think we just want to engage with human beings and to know we are. I feel if there's any doubt or confusion about that it will undermine a lot of what's happening so i don't have a good answer but other than we'll see in six months i think yeah thanks uh, grant uh folks excuse us again for the uh, lack of uh, a lot of time for the q a uh, you will see in the chat i just reposted a message from uh from a minute ago just if you have any questions I think this is a good place for you to put your questions and we'll get to there uh, uh, whenever. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll figure the questions out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but before we go, I would like to ask you a couple of questions because this is a series and hey, we're here to benefit you. We want to learn how to benefit you, you better and better. Uh, so I'm going to ask you two questions to put in the chat. And after that, we're going to have one of those like a 30 second surveys. Um, for, and, and hey, Richard, thank you very much. Actually, let me thank you properly at the end when we wrap things up completely. Um, so folks, uh, if you could share one key takeaway you're taking for Richard's session today, uh, would you please type it on the chat in the next 30 seconds? Sorry, I need to rush here. Oh my God. <laughs> Only one Fiona, sorry. Uh, let's, let's get to the... Let's not dilute our most important information. <laughs> I'm reading focus. I'm reading the structure of engagement. Um, constructing open human questions that share what's the reason you need uh, for you, uh, reason you need to help is. This is great. Tips for starting discussions. 
it's tough. So um, we're gonna do a double question now. Of, uh, you probably are familiar with the what went well and where there's room for improvement. If you could share one thing that you thought went super well and one thing that you think we could improve next time, that would be fantastic. Oh, sorry. It's even better if uh, EBI, I, I, I'm using the old outdated one, sorry. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm hearing from Andy Time Flu. This is always a great sign. <laughs> New content clearly presented. Um, I see a bunch of compliments here, Richard, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting um, what happens if I left the call, you know? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, our people are quite honest, believe me. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you, folks. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, we're going to launch a little uh, poll uh, with, with, I think, two or three questions. It will pop up automatically in front of your Zoom, uh, and that helps us evaluate how how good we did today and how much you benefited from it. I'm so scared now. I've never had live feedback like this before. This is amazing. Very yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what I'd do if it was like poor. You know, if, if it was like very poor, I don't know what I would do. That'd be so awkward. I feel like I should, I should leave the call. <laughs> Jorian wouldn't share it with the group. <laughs> oh wait, so it's just me that can see that can see this. Because you're a co-host. Oh, um, it's because you're co-host, of course. You needed to share your slides. Yeah, you can uh, share this with with the group. I'm 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 um I'm okay with this. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> it's great feedback. Uh, okay, folks, we got eighty percent of participation. I think uh, I think it's time for us to go. Thank you so much, Richard, for today's session. It's been thanks so much. Phenomenal, Richard. phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, and folks, don't forget that this is the first of four sessions. And hey, we started in such a high note. <laughs> I'm gonna ask my colleagues to share the link to Friday sessions that is about communities of practice and. Um, yeah, just uh, in awe with uh, how much Richard ma managed to pack in in just this little amount of time. Thank you so much. Jerry, you're going to have to share the results of the poll because I... Oh, <laughs> is it me? Uh, I'm not doing the tech today. I'm not touching things. <laughs> Somebody's got to share those poll results. Go on. <laughs> oh, I, I can't do this. <laughs> All I can say is it's very, very good. <laughs> Yay. Oh, if uh, people are not paying special attention to the chat now at the end, Richard just shared a free book. I think you should go there. <laughs> just saying. <laughs>